So, well, Darcy, congratulations on the film. Um, hilarious. I was chuckling to myself <laughs> in my um, hotel room, sounding like a, a madman watching it. But um, so, <clears throat> b before we get onto the film itself, would you mind just giving you a little bit of an insight into how drag first ah. came into your life? Sure. Well, probably when I was about three and wanted to be Mary Poppins, <laughs> my parents bought me a dress from the thrift store and an umbrella. I, I think for me, drag and uh, theater really were intertwined. And um, I often wrote for other people, and then I wrote for myself some in, in, with drag characters. And this show was the first one where I really set out to write a show for my strengths and um, and my strength in drag, which is, you know, a certain kind of comedy shtick that I do. And uh, so it, 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 um, it was the first vehicle on stage and now the first vehicle on stage. Yeah. So um, tell me a little bit about, yeah, the development of the character that we, yeah, <laughs> that first appeared on, on stage, Champagne. <laughs> you know, I think that she's an amalgamation of so many... Uh, kind of iconic women that I grew up with both uh, on film and on television from Bionic Woman and Charlie's Angels and uh, Wonder Woman to Pam Greer and Linda Blair and those and those women that kind of um, were those strong female uh, powerhouses of the 70s. Um, I think I also of course, I've been really inspired by Mel Brooks, so Madeline Kahn and Cloris Leachman all, all play a part as well. And and not too earlier, before I first did Shit in Champagne, I had uh, done Glamour, Glory, and Gold, which was a Jackie Curtis play that they remounted at La Mama, where I played Nola Noonan, and she was sort of this tough talking broad. And I think also that I just come off of that, and so it um, that I think probably affected a little bit of Champagne's uh, character. You know, I I showed the movie to a, a acquaintance of mine who said they felt like it was seeing Miss Piggy in <laughs> as a as a, a living, breathing human being. Not because you know I'm overweight, but because. Miss Piggy does that thing where she goes from zero to a hundred in one second, and um, I think it'll really inform my performance in the sequel. No, <laughs> can channel Miss Piggy. Add another diva. <laughs> Add another diva to the list. I mean, who does? I mean, who doesn't love Miss Piggy? Um, so, how did you get the idea to take the stage show and adapt it for a film? So I had done a number of stage shows where we were adapting television shows and movies for the stage and and while inspired by that when I wrote this I created it sort of like we were staging a movie in the sense that we did ridiculous things and we're on the freeway and we're in all these places that you couldn't really ever do on stage and we also did like an entire foley right so we had punches every punch every kick all the background music, it was sort of all laid out there. So when I, I sat down to write the screenplay, it sort of was already done. I got to, I got to do things that I couldn't necessarily do on, um, on stage, but for the most part yeah. it was there. And the truth of the matter is, I had to cut about, I'd say about 35 minutes out of the film, which killed me. And I'm going to have a director's cut one of these days, but most of the things that ended up on the cutting room floor, sans, sans a few things that just really didn't play from the stage, were all the new stuff. I realized that I had a pretty succinct, uh, tight show that didn't need a lot of, a lot of changes for the film. And um, what were some of the things that you were able to do on screen that you can't do on stage? I mean, body double, I guess, for one thing. <laughs> I did the body double. I did, no, I did the body double on stage. So I would dance off, and someone in the same outfit would come on, put her head down, and pop her top off. And we got a huge, <laughs> huge laugh every night. It was the same woman who plays Debbie in The Stripper. She also played my body double in the, in the live stage show. Um, you know, there, we, we, I, we couldn't really... Um, you know, the, the things, you know, an explosion couldn't happen. Spoiler alert. 
Um, it's a good explosion as well. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you, made, you. You made the most out of it. <laughs> um, you know, there were, there were things that we couldn't really uh, oh, get on the freeway or have, have the same kind of, that whole final scene in that basement, you know, that wasn't ever really a possibility. Things that didn't work that got cut were, you know, it's interesting, there's a big sex scene between um, uh, Champagne and her adopt that stepsister, Brandy, in the stage show, which got a huge laugh all the time. It's ridiculous, but we filmed it, but it was obvious we weren't having sex, right? Because you can suspend that ridiculousness live on stage, but when you're actually watching a movie, the hyper-realism, it doesn't translate. You know, we would have really had to do some funny get gags about, you know, cutting, cu inter cutting with body doubles and things like that. And we didn't film it that way, and it really didn't play when we did it in front of a test audience. So, and it does look really cinematic. It'll be exciting for audiences to get to see it on the big screen um, here at Outfest. I love the the seventies vibe and the, those sort of references that come in the music and the look of the movie. So, tell me a little bit about that. Maybe you've touched on some of the inspirations, but the inspirations in creating it on screen. You know, I think that well, I'm a I grew up in the seventies. It is close to my heart, and I. I'm also, sometimes it's, <laughs> to a detriment, uh, attention to detail, maybe a little OCD about certain things, but I I really wanted to, we had to, if we're gonna go with the 70s, we want really to lean into it. And uh, it, it was, it, you know, it, it, was, it was fun and exciting and challenging when you're trying to do, the, you know, on that kind of a budget, really dressing everybody in the 70s, but I, I um, you know, it's been something that I've I've loved for a long time, and I, I even when I first moved to San Francisco when I was 18 years old, I worked in a vintage shop that had dead stock 60s and 70s clothes with all the original tags on, platform shoes, with all the tags, and and so it's sort of been in my in my zeitgeist, you know, the whole, for all this time. To the, the 70s does play a big part, of it. and. and you know, it is a pretty fabulous period of time. It's interesting what is, what gets kept, isn't it? Because I had a friend who was making a movie that even found like, you know, vintage seventies underwear that was still in the wrapper. Yeah, <laughs> it is amazing when you can find. It's like museum, it's like a museum. Yeah. Those, those those flashbacks. And so, tell me a little bit about the cast that we get to see in the film. Um, some drag uh, queens, some drag kings, and um, Alaska, who uh, people yes. will know from RuPaul's Drag Race. You know, it, I used a lot of my original cast from the San Francisco production, not the New York production. Um, but folks that I, I love working with, and they really, I've worked with them so much on stage, and in not only this show, but other shows, and they really understand my shorthand of, of what this is. I like to call it Vaudeville 2.0, which is, is sort of like a heightened, a heightened reality of va the Vaudeville experience, sort of like what Mel Brooks was doing or what the Zucker brothers were doing with the airplane and things like that, where it's that real slapstick, but taking it to the screen. And, and working with them has been so fun because I don't have to explain the heightened reality that everybody's living in. Um, so that, that was great. And, I, and some people that weren't in the stage show, but I've worked with them a lot. Lee Crow is, is, you know, used to be Elvis herself, was quite a famous drag king. Um, and uh, Matthew Martin, Genius as Dixie is one of you know the world's best Betty Davis impersonators, um, and of course Alaska. Now Alaska is uh, a friend of mine, and, and she comes a lot to perform at my club. But we've also she guest starred in Sex in the City live when we did it. She guest starred in The Golden Girls, so I've had uh, I've had the privilege of, of working. Um, with Alaska a number of times, and, and just a salt of the earth person, just so sweet, but also again just innately understands what I'm trying to do. So it's real easy, and I, you know, she had to remember that really long name I I had, and I made that name up literally that morning about five minutes before we shot that, and I I remember I'm like, sorry girl, you're gonna have to, 
<laughs> to learn this crazy name, and I could barely, I could barely do it. I was so impressed that she was able to rattle it off, but you could see, like, she's like, "Can I get this? Can I get this?" And we only had to do it a couple of times. <laughs> now it is a great moment in the film because I was like, "Is she going to try and say that whole name?" Because I, <laughs> I can remember like the first part of it. But that's <laughs> so much of those jokes are like pushing it, right? Like it's Brandy falling down, like falling down three times is sort of funny. Falling down four times starts to get not funny, but if you push it to the fifth and the sixth, then it's funny. But it is that that kind of comedy, I think, is really scary. And B. Arthur talked about that a lot in some interviews with hers, where she would talk about it's dangerous to do that, to, to push things further, to hold the long, slow burn, because there's a point where the laughter subsides, but then if you're just... If you're fearless and keep going, then it, it becomes so much funnier. But you have to really trust the craft. Um, and in terms of that sort of pushing the comedy, are there, uh, can you translate most of the things that would work on stage to screen? Or were there some new new things like that that you maybe even pushed a little bit further for the film version? For, for screen? Yeah. Well, yeah, like where I could actually have... You know, the scene where she's kicking on the beach and he holds both of her legs and the third leg comes up. Things like that that I really, you can't do. You can't do otherwise. Um, I, I feel like, I, I you know, it, it's my first film. And while I, I feel like I knew what I was getting into, it was a huge education for me. And so I'm looking forward to the next one, understanding a little bit more really how far you can push in certain areas and what works and what doesn't. And I know that, you know, everything is different and it's all relative, but I do, I do think uh, the next film will be somewhat easier in identifying what's going to work. And, you know, I, I spoke with so many people before I actually started producing the film that were, you know, really pushing me you know, away from it, saying, you know, oh, stage to screen doesn't work. Uh, taking a play and making it into a film doesn't work. And, you know, there's plenty of those, th plenty of plays that, that go to screen. And, and some, you can say some work and some don't, but I felt pretty confident that this would translate. And, and I think it does. Well, and I guess partly because the inspiration for it is a lot of the, the exploitation, exploitation movies and it's got sort of a movie... Um, in its DNA, hasn't it, I suppose, in some ways. So, it it yeah. does. And it was it, funny you bring that up because, you know, I I worked with um, a lot of uh, young people, kind of, you know, maybe starting out in their careers and, and are great, great at their, you know, the cinematographer and the, the lighting folks and people that, you know, were willing to jump on this and almost, you know, I, want, I don't want to say they were too good for the movie, but they were willing to do it to have, you know, more feature film experience. But the irony is a lot of them work on commercials and where you spend so much time trying to make everything so perfect. And the, it, it was humorous, the sort of disconnect of me telling them, I want this to look bad, purposely bad. And, and they really couldn't fathom it, it, yeah. Even like to the point of I have a there's a dance scene in the alley and I'm like okay I'm gonna get the shortest person that I can find to be my body double my dance double in that scene so it's just ridiculous and they like filmed everything they try, kept trying to make her look as tall as she could like I couldn't find anyone my height you know it was and and, and I, I'm not sorry about it it may not look as as cheap as I wanted it to originally look, but you know, for the budget we had, it looks like a million bucks. You know, they did a great job at, and it looks very lush and and uh, I'm, I'm I'm super happy with what they they did. And what about the music? Because there's some there's some great music in it, and again, sticking with the kind of '70s yes. vibe. Yeah, super important. Now, Steve Bollinger wrote all the original music, and he's I think a total genius in terms. I mean, whatever he puts his mind to do, but like I I could say. Give me something that sounds like Donna Summer, Enough is Enough. And he and Zelda, who sang on that song, you know, in like a week had this great, you know, dance song that harkens harkens back to those classics. And and you know, originally we were like, well, maybe we can get the rights to these big fancy fancy um, pop songs from the seventies and they were just ridiculously expensive and 
the music was going to cost more than making the film. And I'm, in a way, I feel lucky that we did that because it really did force us to create an original score, an original soundtrack that is, you know, is ours and unique and sounds great. And and the other incidental music, a lot of it we took from the um, uh, KPM, which is a, which was basically like television music from the 60s and 70s, and some classic songs that ended up turning into like. Um, divorce court theme. There's a song in there that basically was the original song that then divorce court used as their theme song. And a lot of this uh, kind of classic 60s and 70s television music that maybe you don't you don't uh, really recognize, but it sounds so authentic and, it, and it's because it is. And so we, we basically it was a combination of both those things to create that soundtrack. And that's when, it, I, to me, the film really comes to life, when you layer all that in. Because without that, um, I feel like you miss a lot of the humor. Yeah, and it kind of immerses you into the period too, totally, doesn't it? Totally, and, uh, Yeah. So, um, we're here at Outfest, of course, for the screening, and there's going to be a special event sort of before the screening. Isn't there? Can you give us a little bit of flavor of um, what's going to be happening? So, we're going to do what we did for the live productions, which was create an immersive environment that you walk into to see the film. So, you know, instead of the usual lights up and find your seat and wait for the movie to start, when you come in, the lights will be dim, they'll be red, and we've got eight strippers, strippers, um, exotic dancers, um, and sort of like the the toothless and ruthless exotic dancers, the ones, you know, because it's supposed to be the Shaboom Boom Room, which is the rundown uh, strip club that, that the, where the film begins. And uh, so we're going to create that environment for, for the folks. And Debbie, who is in the film, will be doing her lackluster stripping, you know, probably the world's worst stripper, which, <laughs> you know, all the, there's so many more things that we, we uh, filmed her doing for the movie that didn't make it in, but she would do that. So when we originally did the show, she'd spend 45 minutes like doing really aggressive lap dances and peeling band-aids off of her herself, and people loved it. And it really got the audience to a place where they could, um, interact more with the show and, and then it became this thing where people were doing this call and response very rocky horror to the point where these people came over and over this this core group of people they must have come a dozen times and they called themselves the shitheads and they were uh the like hardcore aggressive fans and that's sort of that moment where i thought this could become this could become a movie um because they were they literally were there every week and having a club um, in San Francisco, I'm, I'm sure people from you know, all over the country and all over the world probably perform there, but having you know, lived in New York and lived in San Francisco, is there something distinctive about San Francisco drag? Yes. I mean, I would say San Francisco drag is not as polished as L.A. or New York all the time, but what San Francisco drag is is... Um, people willing to take chances and risks and people willing to um, try things. Um, it is a, a space, I think, where sort of this um, almost punk rock aesthetic around drag happened back in the early 90s that I think really you can see affected a lot of the rest of the country or the world. Um, uh, people the, sh the showmanship around drag too, where a lot of times you'll come to other cities and people, you know, a drag queen gets up and lip syncs and takes money. And that's what you think of a drag show. And in San Francisco, they'll put on huge productions with backup dancers and giant set pieces and all this stuff. They almost created music videos. And I think, I think so that it's, it's this sort of art damaged, um, beautifully art damaged uh, drag scene. And, and because of that, you know, that's to me what, I lived in New York for a long time and what, what drew me back to San Francisco was the willingness to take chances, to try things out, to incubate new work. And that, um, you know, that was, one of the, that was one of the things that excited me to come back and then opening the club made me, made me stay. 
And the name of the club's uh, Oasis, right? It's Whereabouts Oasis. is it in the city? It's um, South of Market on 11th and Folsom. It is sort of in the entertainment corridor, uh, about a block and a half from the Eagle. It's, it used to be called the Oasis. Um, originally, it was a bathhouse called the Plunge in the 70s, and then in the mid 80s, or no, sorry, the early 80s, it became the Oasis, and it was, it, actually, sorry, I take that back, the late 70s into the 80s, it was Oasis, and was, it had a swimming pool from where it was a bathhouse, and they would put a plexiglass dance floor over it at night. So during the day, you could swim, the roof would open, and then they put a dance floor on it and light it up from underneath. Um, it was pretty fabulous, and it was also the place where, like, when the Trocadero would close each each morning at 6 a.m., everyone would come over to the Oasis, and, and bands would play, and you could, like, hang out in the pool. There was a kitchen. It was a pretty fabulous place, and then it, it closed and became a number of other locations, and when I reopened it, I, I did want to harken back to the the heyday of, of like, queer San Francisco in the in the 70s in soma when it was sort of a no man's land <clears throat> and a really a place that was sort of a, a gay uh haven because it, it the rest of the city hadn't really found out about it yet there were no residential areas it was, there, across the street was the very first leather bar that opened up in 1967 called phoebe's um so there's a lot of culture and history around there and so i felt like it was important Put a spotlight on that. Does it still have the pool in there or anything? I, I filled the pool <laughs> in. Don't be mad. Don't be mad. I know, but it was one of those things where someone had fallen through the plexiglass and sued them, and I'm okay. like, you know what? I'm trying to create a hybrid theater nightclub situation. I don't need the novelty of a swimming no, pool as really much as yeah. much as it's fabulous. I, yeah. I it wasn't really what. We were setting out to do. I can't help but think of um, It's a Wonderful Life, you know, when <laughs> the um, the boards start coming <laughs> yes. when they fall, they fall in the pool. So exactly. that was my first thought too. Well, just a, a final question for you, and it's um, for your favorite um, LGBTQ plus piece of culture uh, or a person who identifies as LGBTQ plus, just someone or something that's had an impact on you and kind of resonated with you over the years. <clears throat> I mean, I have so many. I would say in thinking I feel like the person that is sort of close to doing the same thing that I do and has inspired me for a long time would be Charles Bush and uh, you know for someone who is both a writer independent of their own vehicles as well as um, writing for themselves for both stage and screen and also they, you know, so many people are making movies and doing shows about drag queens when Charles does something similar to what I do and actually play a female character. And are, it is a, a very different concept that most people are doing these days. And, but it is, Charles has been an inspiration and in getting to um, uh, meet Charles and get to know Charles a little bit fabulous new part of my, my life and days. both here at Outfest of Tours I know. we'll be speaking to Charles later um, in the that. week for, about his film The Sixth Reel that's uh, showing the festival he, yeah. he, he came with his um, cabaret act a number of times to the club and um, I was uh, I've known his accompanist for some years and so it was a great way to get to know him I remember I remember <laughs> finally getting to go out to dinner with him and it being a little bit uh Tongue tied, you know, but we've we've since become good friends, and I feel I feel uh, very lucky. Yes, but as you say, playing uh, champagne, you know, we should have met, or I should have mentioned before, isn't a, a drag queen. She, she's a woman. The character is a woman, and you're she's playing a, her. Sometimes as a woman. she's a rather large, manly woman, but <laughs> she is a woman. Yes. So it sort of harkens back towards a yeah, divine uh, on screen and hairspray, for instance. Yes. Or, yeah, I mean, you, in the dust. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Where, yeah. where it's really, you know, there's a... I mean, and I, I, I think this for all my characters, especially Champagne, but like, you know, I am... I, there's a lot of sincerity around my portrayal of her. I'm not making fun of her at all. Um, 
and that's really what, as a director, that's what I'm really pushing all of my actors to do. Like, we're not making fun of the material, we're not making fun of the characters, we're leaning into them, and there's a lot of honesty behind it. You know, I think people think of drag or think of slapstick, and they really don't think of the actual hard work, the honesty, the technique that goes into something like this. And so it is uh, <laughs> rather serious to make a comedy in that respect. Yeah. And I think people sometimes don't take it as seriously because of the drag. But to me, the drag blows it up unless you look at it sort of more under a microscope. And I think you can really, um, you know, I, you can play with themes and ideas uh, a lot more in with crossing gender and, and camp. Cool. Darcy Drollinger, thanks very much. Congratulations on Shit and Champagne. You're welcome. Uh, people will be able to see it at uh, Outfest and also stream virtu screen virtually, so we'll put details of that below the video. Thank you. Thank you.